I am Nicholas Bornolis of Capital Inc. And I would like to welcome you today to our webinar series, Dr. Martin Stopford. We're delighted to have Martin with us today to kick off a series of four webinars on the topic of managing maritime innovation in an era of change. So starting today and every second Thursday, we'll be, we will be hosting a webinar in this uh, series. The first webinar will look at the business model to understand what drives innovation. The second webinar at innovation in ship propulsion. The third uh, webinar at innovation in ship systems. And the final and fourth webinar will focus on company strategy for managing through the years ahead. Everyone knows Dr. Stopford, so I do not need to uh, go through uh, a, a lengthy introduction for him. I would like to mention before turning the floor over to him that how uh, grateful we are that he is joining us again. Uh, he had uh, a marathon session uh, back uh, in uh, April 2020 on the topic of coronavirus, climate change, and smart shipping, three scenarios uh, for 2020 to 2050, preparing for changes that were in the cards. That webinar that attracted thousands of people and lasted uh, for three hours, Martin, if I remember, it was an amazing prelude, if you want, to uh, this uh, four webinars that we are launching today. We have had three years to think about the major changes, climate change, smart shipping and globalization, and how companies can cope uh, with uh, all this innovation at once. So we are delighted to have today uh, to kick off the first webinar on the business model for maritime innovation 2020 to 2050. Martin, the floor is yours, by the way, just to mention that um, two things, uh, our participants can submit questions to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And Dr. Stopford uh, is going to reply to your questions at the end of his live presentation. And secondly, uh, you can visit capitallinkwebinars.com to download slides of the presentation. So they will be available for download there. And Martin, the floor is yours. And again, thank you for being with us. Uh, Nicholas, thank, thank you so much. Um, it's, I mean, and thank you for giving me the chance to sort of have a run through of this, this topic. I, as you mentioned, it's, you know, three years ago, I was sort of looking at the scenarios in that marathon session. And um, I, I, every year I've tried to update that paper. And the trouble is there's been a, a deluge of information coming through. And I almost feel that I'm getting submerged in, I just don't know what to, uh, you know, where to focus next. And I'm very conscious that for the last year, I've hardly been able to keep up with the technical flow of change. So what I want to try and do in this um, set of webinars is not not to compete with the sort of heavyweights, you know, people like DNV, who are doing very, um, sort of, you know, substantial and authoritative um, uh, webinars, but to try and look from a, a, an economist, perhaps with a technical slant point of view, how we actually can simplify the model so that we can understand it, so that you can make decisions in an environment where there seem to be too many options. And that, that's my aim. I, I've, um, I've got a few slides to share with you as I've got about 15 slides. And so what I'd like to do now is to, to share my screen with you and perhaps we can, um, we can move forward and look through the first um, part of this session, which is the um, uh, the, the business model for, for, for maritime innovation 2020 to 2050. That's that's the title of it. And uh, the idea here is to, to, to look at the framework. And then uh, once we've done that, we can go on and look at the detail in the later in the later sessions. Uh, if we um, if we look at what, I, what I'm going to do is to divide this session into three parts. Um, but, and the theme of the three parts is, uh, is it's a phrase that I came across as I was sort of get, preparing. Um, Peter Drucker has a wonderful way of summarizing succinct points extremely well. And one of the, I, I reread his book, Managing the Future, 
And one of the things he said, which I, I, you know, I'd commend to anyone who hasn't read it, um, and one of the things he said is, innovations do not create change. That is rare. Innovations succeed by exploiting change, not attempting to force it. And you know, I think this this seems to me to really catch the spirit of what we're trying to do. We're not trying to sort of change there's a if you like a, a a wave of change going forward and we're not trying to change that or manipulate it what we're trying to do is to surf it to find what is the best way to productively surf change to meet the requirements of the various stakeholders in the business um, the cargo interests the bankers the regulators, and of course, most importantly, the stakeholders in the, the shipping companies themselves. And so I'll be splitting this into three parts. Um, the first part is how the innovation model works, and at least how it's worked in the past. And I think most of you um, know I have a slight weakness for, for, for injecting a bit of history, but I've really, in, in preparing for this, I've really enjoyed reading it and researching in more detail how the people and companies manage change in the past uh, and then we'll move on to the demand profile and the, the sort of global issues the um the, de the globalization what's that going to mean and um, then finally in the third part of this webinar we're going to look at the market in a driven innovation model because I think one of the conclusions I came to as I looked through all of this was that, um, that, that there's a, a requirement for change, which is going to it's going to call for investment. Uh, it's going to call, call for changes in management structure. And um, the, the problem is that in a way we've been working with a, a market driven model, which features very much in my book that it's not in every, any way, it's not in every way very suitable for managing this sort of change. Well, that's the question that we've got to answer. Well, if we um, if we start with the first part, the innovation model, um, I, I, I think you know, the the first perspective to get here is the fact that um, the shipping industry used to be a completely green industry. Hundred and this this is a picture of the Herzogin uh, uh, Cecily, uh, one of the probably the peak of sailing ships. Um, it was built in 1902, long after steam had started, and it was still carrying uh, voyage cargo at this stage. And this was the end and the pinnacle of what you could do with um, green shipping at that time. Just to sort of put that into perspective, this is um, a voyage. This is the noon sightings uh, of a voyage uh, that the, the, the vessel made uh, from Australia to uh, Falmouth in uh, 1932. So it's very late in the day. The, the ship was built in 1902. And you see, this is each day's voyage, um, average speed. It peaked at around seven knots as it was going through the Southern Oceans, nasty place for sailors. And then around the, the Cape and in the Southern Atlantic, it was slower. And then it picked up as it got into the North Atlantic. Well, that uh, if, if we look at um, the, the trade that was developed uh, during the, the the last 200 years since fossil fuels started to come into the business, um, it tells us a very, very clear story about what the shipping industry has done. Um, this chart is seaborne trade. It starts in 1850. I would be the first to admit that so these statistics are not necessarily precise, but they're good enough for jazz. And in 1850, the, the shipping industry was carrying 50 million tons of cargo a year, roughly. And you could have done that with 3,500 of those very sophisticated sailing barks like the, uh, the Herzog and uh, Cecily. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> Any Germans will tell me, no doubt. Um, uh, but uh, the, probably the trade was carried by a whole range of ships, much smaller ships, probably 20,000 smaller ships. If we were to carry today's seaborne trade with that particular sailing vessel, you would need 1.4 million 
sailing barks. And you need 30, about 30 million, 40 million crew to, to man them compared with not much more than a million today and getting less. So this, th th this whole period, uh, this growth of trade was totally created by fossil fuels. And um, the era started, I would say, in 1852 with a ship called the John Bowes, which has some important lessons for us. And I'll come back to the John Bowes in a minute because and try, the theme here is what people did and why they did them. And I want to talk very briefly about what, what the people who built the John Bowes did and, and, and why they were doing it and what it achieved. Um, but before that, let's just take a look at the, you know, the, the driver of the shipping market is the cycles. And this is a chart, I've updated it. It's, uh, it's to over, uh, well over 200 years of shipping cycles. And I think this tells you what we all know, that the shipping industry is dominated by these cycles. And, you know, haven't we done well recently? Um, but actually, it doesn't really tell you the whole story, because if we adjust that chart for inflation, we get a very, very different story, which is much more relevant to the subject I want to talk to you about today. And that is the cost of transporting cargo. Uh, and, and this is my uh, freight index in real terms, based in 2000, 2000 equals 100. And it shows you the cost in adjusted for inflation over this period. And I think the index is not bad, but you see very that, that during the seven from 1740 to 1800, the cost of freight was actually going up. It went up nearly doubled. And that was because sailing ships had reached their zenith. It was, you know, wood was running out of steam, as they say. That's not so mixing metaphors too much. And um, wood was in scarce supply because the, the navies were hard at work burning down and cutting down forests. You're having to import wood. And then from 1800 onwards, as the fossil fuels came in, the cost of freight went down. It went down for, by, it, it nearly halved by um, to 1914. That was the steamships. And then it went down another step in the period to 2000. And then it looks like it might beginning, it's beginning to go up again. And if you, like me, believe that we are really at the end of an era, which is always a very exciting time, then that's a trend we want to look at. So talk about the model. What is the model? What are the variables in the model that were driving this 95% reduction in the real cost of freight, which the shipping industry achieved over the, the, the fossil fuel period? And the... Um, there are seven variables. The first, of course, was fuel. We went from wind to coal to cheap oil to expensive oil. Uh, but then, of course, there was the whole question of speed. Speeds in the sailing era were totally constrained, and you were lucky to do three, you know, you could sometimes do only two knots on a transatlantic voyage. Um, and then once coal came along, it was the, 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 the lower speeds in the coal era or just due to the fact you needed, you know, 20 people in the boiler room of a modest sized ship in order to stoke the boilers. And um, uh, the range was 80 to 30. If you wanted to, you could go uh, 30 knots as they did for the big transatlantic liners, but you needed hundreds of people stoking them, you know. Um, then along came oil, which was just wonderful because you could redesign the ship about this easily, pumped on board, stick it in a double bottom or somewhere out of the way, pump it into the engine room, and then use it in an internal combustion engine, which got more and more efficient and more and more powerful. And so then the, the speed range was 16 to 23. As the oils got more expensive, which is already happening, it's that the, the speeds have come down. And so speed is a big variable. The, the third one is the propulsion system, sail, steam, triple expansion, slow speed diesel engines, massive improvements in the steam engine. Um, the fourth variable is the ship size. Uh, we were talking about 150 gross tons 
uh, uh, for a typical ship in 1870-90. That went up to perhaps uh, one and a half thousand gross tons for a big steamship in 1860 and reached 36,000 tons last year, uh, which, you know, talking about uh, 45,000 tons of cargo or something like that for a bulk carrier. And that is 240 times bigger. So ship size has been a very important variable in the model. And that, that, is, that, that is actually coming, uh, it's reaching diminishing returns of scale at the upper end. And I think you have to look at the lower end of the ship size scale in order to um, find really good improvements from that variable. Logistic systems played a massive part. Um, you really couldn't do logistics when you were doing sail ships. It was too, it, it was just, you didn't have the information and you couldn't control the ships. You didn't know when they'd, they'd sail. Then we got the Trump and the liner cargo liner system, which was a good start, but very inefficient. And then when oil came along after the Second World War, we found that the, the, the specialized shipping bulks, specialized vehicle carriers, et cetera, containerization, these three logistics developments, and that's what they were, um, revolutionized shipping. And that was when the real growth of global ship, maritime trade started. Uh, information. These these were sitting in the background. These are what I would call enabling variable information systems. You needed information systems to enable these systems to work. And we're moving into the automation area. And of course, automation has been around since the early 60s with um, with autopilots and with unmanned engine rooms and so forth. So those are the seven variables. Um, I said I'd bring bring you back to the uh, the John Bowes. Um, this was, and the reason I wanted to do this is this is a ship that was launched in 1852 for the, uh, the the coal trade from London from Tyneside down to um, uh, down to London. What was driving the ordering of this ship was the fact that the railways were coming in and, pr and providing coal that was competing with the sea trade, which had been there for. 30 year, 40 years. And the, um, the mine owner, John Bowes, by who he was, uh, was keen to get faster delivery. And he teamed up with Charles Palmer, the shipbuilder, and they designed this revolutionary new ship. I mean, it doesn't it look modern? Okay, it's got a bit of a bow. It had a, it had a screw propeller at the back. You can't see it. Um, it carried uh, 437 gross tons, carried 650 tons of cargo. And uh, it did carry still a full topsail rig, as you can see, but it also had um, a ballast water system. Instead of having to load stone, which was a very laborious process, it, it, you, it pumped ballast water in and out of the cargo tanks with, of the um, double bottoms, which made an enormous difference to the logistics. And this ship was able to, uh, which did nine knots, was able to complete a trip to London in five days, delivering 650 tons and returning uh, of coal. And that would have taken two conventional sailing colliers, the best of the, of the range at that time for a month. So a massive productivity improvement. And I think, you know, this is important because when you look at technology, you're looking at things that will actually produce value added. I mean, it's technology, when you're riding that wave, you need the technology that helps, that actually helps you to ride that wave better. Um, and the big challenge we face now is that um, the, you know, this, I've just fitted a curve to this. It's, it's, it's a polynomial, so, but, um, uh, uh, the, the challenge today, as we move out of the sort of cheap fossil fuel era, maybe we stick to them when we capture the carbon, but we're moving out of this era. And the challenge is to keep the 95% productivity improvement that we've got from fossil fuels. Um, and yet at the same time to use these variables to produce a more productive and higher value added business. So 
surfing that wave, surfing this wave is a value added job, which the business really needs to get to grip with. And these are the variables in the model. They all come into my model um, in different ways. And I won't go through that at the moment. If uh, I'd be happy to talk to anyone who's interested in the detail. But um, fundamentally, these seven variables are all going to contribute in these ways. Have a look at them when you get the slides to actually constructing a business plan, which will enable you to add value in this while surfing these waves. Well, uh, let's move on to the second part of the, the which is the demand model, because one of the challenges that the business has is to respond to changes in the demand for sea transport. And it does look as though they are going to be very substantial. I mean, these I've just taken, um, you know, current forecasts, but the, the, the consensus seems to be that population is going to grow to 10 billion people by 2050. And at the moment, we ship about 1.4 ton tons per capita. So if they're typical people, which they may probably, they may be, you know, because living standards are going up, then you're talking about three or four billion tons just there. And in addition, uh, the World Bank's last forecast was that you're going to double GDP by 2050. And again, this is going to deal with something different because within that GDP, you've got some very mature economies which are going more service based and probably less, much less deep sea intensive. And But you've also got um, a, a bunch of other companies that are going up the development curve. Um, and uh, this is just very briefly, this is the uh, development cycles in trade, which show you how much the volume of trade depends on individual regions going through this growth phase, you know, so it was Europe in the 50s, Japan in the 60s, and Korea and the, the Tigers, and then the whole of other Asia has grown very steadily, perhaps bucking this trend, it's not really slowed down at all yet. And then China, um, the, I was going to say as fast as Europe, but actually uh, faster than Europe, but it's very not dissimilar to Europe, but on a bigger scale. And so we're looking for when China will mature as an economy and start to um, move more to value added, which I think, you know, a lot of many of the signs are there. I don't think we, you know, the, the Chinese would argue with that. It's part of a process of doing what GNP is about, which is make, building a better life for the people in, in the countries. But what this does mean when you put it all together, and I have a bit, I ran it out in a spreadsheet, it's not a, um, you know, it, it, uh, I've been looking at this a long time, but um, on, on this trend, the uh, Atlantic has been losing market share and will, is likely to continue to lose market share. And Asia, if you like, east of Suez, is, um, however, and it's difficult to define, um, is, is gaining market share. So, you know, I think any business needs to look at where it's going to fit into the, the, the geopolitics of this changing regional world on the demand side. And that, of course, um, comes along together with the whole commodity question, because I mean, I think many of you all have seen this chart before, and I haven't really updated it for about a year because um, I haven't quite nailed down how much green fuel will be moving and quite how fast. This is the BP prediction for the decline in fossil fuels, very dependent on fossil fuels still until 2050. Um, and this is something we'll discuss in later sessions but um, generally speaking this fits in with my middle scenario of trade uh, which we've got here um, that you know we have a much lower greater growth of trade than we've had in the past uh, to about 15 billion tons Not, that means you've got some structural reductions as well as the uh, uh, because underlying this we're assuming GDP is growing fast and population is growing fast um, and then, you know, the, the, the big growth scenario, you might find, you know, that things blow over. It did in the 70s, you know, it took a long time, but 
we, we got out of the recession of the last time we had one of these global crises in the 70s. It eventually came to an end and the growth restarted. You can see it here, you know, it went flat and then it, it recovered. We couldn't believe, I mean, I don't suppose any of us would have believed that trade would be 12 billion tons. So one step at a time. And there is also the problem that we get a little bit of a meltdown. And um, all you can do is, um, is build the best business you can to cope with these things. Well, we're moving towards the, the end of this now, but let me um, come to the third part the market-driven innovation model and how that can be used to surf the wave of change. Um, and I mean, what I'm going to be arguing is that this needs a very systematic, I don't think for these periods of change, uh, you can wing it. And some people have, you know, I mean, some of the people, and I'll go into this in the fourth lecture, some of the people who actually managed major changes in the past did it um, they're not the sort of people that would have sat down and made a structured, a, a structural plan, but others were. And in many ways, you know, it's horses for courses. You have to figure out which of the changes you can do, you, uh, uh, are the, the hands-on ones that you, uh, and which ones are actually the, the ones driven by carefully structured uh, management and organization building. Um, the, the framework here um, of the maritime innovation model is the, our faithful supply demand analysis. Um, it's, uh, I mean, anybody who's looked at my book will be familiar with this. We've got the de demand, we've got the, the supply. Um, sitting back here, we've got the cargo interests and the cargo companies, which are two different animals in many ways. And these are very big stakeholders in periods of change. I mean, in periods when things are stable, they tend to, you know, they've got other fish to fry and they tend to sort of rely on the, on the shipping industry to provide cheap freight, which the industry has been very good at doing. Um, but when things are changing, um, they, the cargo do have to think, you know, they have a position to cover. And down here, we've got the shipping investors and the shipping companies, two very different things. Um, and we've got the balance sheets, the cash flow from the supply and demand. And the first, the point I want to make here is that this, I, I think this model is very problematic for the sorts of things that we're looking at going ahead um, because um, the, the, the whole, the, the, this model is designed towards cost minimization, and it's been fine for the last 50 years, where you didn't have to lay out very large sums of capital, especially on infrastructure. But if you're coming into a period where infrastructure is needed, where you're actually building fleets of new technology, um, which are not really bankable, then somehow you've got to fund that. And that is the big issue. And there are four in innovation variables, if you like, or four innovation areas that um, I've superimposed into this model. And the first and the obvious one is the fleet retrofit investment. Um, the existing fleet is going to generate half the emissions in the period up to 2050. It is very important. And there are lots of ways you can bring the changes on that. And I think it's, again, this is something which it, I'll be talking about in detail, well, more detail later, but it's something which businesses need to, um, will get great benefit out of doing a structured, uh, you know, uh, doing a structured fleet retrofit strategy will actually help companies to learn more enough about the detail of their business to implement both the decarbonization and the digitalization of the, the, the new ships that they order and to get new systems for the ships that they're already running. The, the second variable is um, the new ship investment. And the big question here is who pays? I mean, you know, the, the sorts of typical returns for bulk shipping, 8% uh, is my, my, my sort of simulation over 30, 40 years comes up with 8% return. 
a um, couple of percent over LIBOR, that doesn't generate the funds to make major changes. And it's with the cycles we've got, it's not a good base for actually putting in place risky new variables that need a bit of stability so you can develop organizations and capabilities and structures. Um, so you need to think hard about how who participates here. And the cargo um, clearly are there in an important way. And the shipping investors are there in an important way. And, you know, who, who, who's going to do this? Um, the third one uh, is the... Um, um, is rethinking the logistics systems because you know the logistics systems we have today were put together in the 60s and they things have changed and we've suddenly got this wonderful I mean in the 60s EDI for, con for containerization was a nightmare you know you were, had these highly simplistic computer models now you've got wonderful technology and semi-automation but a lot of legacy systems. And so I think the whole um, question of rethinking the logistics so that we we get the minimum, we're able to minimize door-to-door -door carbon. That's the big thing. And then finally, um, fuel funding strategy of ship and cargo interests. Of course, in the spot market, the um the, the, the cargo ends up paying for the fuel, but um, the question really is how the cookie crumbles on this and how when you get into the, if you do get into putting in very expensive green fuels costing thousands of dollars a tonne um, into your ships, how that cost is spread. Uh, because there's lots of things you can do with the existing ships to complete. I mean, one is you can slow them down a lot, you know. So um, those are the four variables. Um, the you know, the heavyweights in this whole thing are the cargo owners and the shipping investors of one sort or another. Uh, we've got the usual framework, the spot market, the period market. The cargo owners come in and start to own their own ships or, or leasing and that sort of thing. And um, somehow this, there's been some very good and productive talk from both sides on this, and there are some great forums, but the question is whether you can nail down something which is bankable. And again, I want to, I'm looking at the, the last session, I'm going to go through some of these case studies to show how, but this is not new territory, it's happened in the past, and the problems are not different, uh, but far from it, in fact. So in, in summary, there's four issues we need to think about. Um, the first one is the costly technology. Green propulsion under development is a poor alternative to heavy fuel oil. It's going to be very expensive. And the cost of fuel and the cost of infrastructure for all sorts of things that you want to do in order to build a new, to surf the wave of change is going to be very hard to fund out of the traditional supply uh, shipping market cash flows that we oh well of course <laughs> um you know we've had a we've had a little taste of what the um in, in the container business uh, in the last three years of what the market can do if uh, if you get lucky and billions of dollars coming in but it's still it, it's a tricky one you know it's all very well dumping a load of money in but that's maybe you can find a better way to do that. Um, the second one is commoditized markets. Uh, sea transport operates through, uh, through that and commoditized markets are going to cut costs. And so again, we're back into this question of how we get value added recognized. The, the third one is investment funds are likely to be out of, as I've said, out of all proportion to the current levels of profits. And finally, motivation. Nobody likes to change. And I find it, having worked on the IT for 10 years and, um, well, similar time on the decarbonisation, I find it hard to see how you're going to do this without changing a lot of the things you do. And people don't like to do it. I mean, none of us do. And so the big issue is um, what is the compelling force for change what will drive it through and make people do things they don't really want to do and that well these are the issues so on that note uh, ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for your patience and back to you Nicholas I think 
I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can. There we go. Martin, I think at this point uh, you have a number of questions to. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, right. Let me have a look at my. Uh, well, the first uh, one. And do you want to take it yourself or do you want me to uh, direct well, it? If you, yes, if you'd like to kick off with the first one while I sort of uh, take a quick breath, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Perfect. So the first one is, what is the timeline for the innovation model? Uh, and what do you think can be done in the next couple of years? Well, this is um, I, I, what I'm hoping to do in these four series is to help people to make up their, you know, to, to, to draw their own conclusion, because every business is different. And there are some very, very different companies in the shipping market, 26,000 companies. And many different business models there so i think but but basically i think you you why the way i always look at it is you've got three years to get you started because that's the delivery time for new ships and i'm going to be pushing for it for um that that's a period where you're going to be trying doing things like retrofitting and developing strategies the, then you go into the period where you're starting to get new building technology available, and so you can make sensible new building decisions. And then the, the, the third step, which takes you really into the 2030s, and by that time, there will be, I think, some very big changes in technology available. So I think it's those three steps, and that's the way I see it. I don't think there's a great, there isn't a great rush at the moment. I think now's the time to take a big breath look at all these facts and then decide what you really can do and if you can do it you know then martin the, the next question is you talked about uh, regional changes taking place uh, now uh, so how would they affect shipping well this is um you, <laughs> you picked the two to, the two central points here um i i mean in a way the the today's shipping industry has grown rich on well it's it's not grown it's it's enjoyed a period of stable and rewarding growth built around the volatility of globalization and suddenly that globalization model is changing it, I, I mean recently the economist interestingly it's, it the, there was one phase i i always read the economist very carefully and there was one phase when they were saying, well, you know, globalization's kept grinding to a halt because the multinationals are pulling out. Now what they seem to be saying is that um, we shouldn't look at the end of globalization. We should look at um, an evolution of globalization. And I think that's quite true. And part of that evolution is the growth I showed you, um, this changing balance between the Atlantic and the Pacific, and also um, the fact that we need to focus on getting the logistics systems to work better. And I think that takes us into the small end of the market and helps us to focus on the local trades, which are very neglected compared with the deep sea trades, which get all the pundits, you know. Martin, another question that, by the way, someone is asking about uh, the slides. The slides are downloadable please go to capitalinkwebinars.com and you click on the webinar and you will see an option to download the slides. So, uh, yes, that's because uh, I'll give you, I, as always, Nicholas, I've slightly tweaked my, I, I always tweak my slides till the last minute. So I'll send you the very latest version uh, uh, as soon as we log off and then perhaps you and with a few notes and you and Delaney can pop them on when that's uh, Absolutely. And if anyone, why, you know, if you can't download them, please email us at uh, forum at capitalink.com or webinars at capitalink.com and we'll uh, send them to you. Okay. Uh, well, shall I have a start to run through some of these q and yes, of course, by all means. Well, thanks again for, uh, I'm sorry, I took a bit longer than I expected, which when no one will be surprised at. <laughs> it's, uh, um, you know what economists are like. Uh, the the uh, the, well, the first one I've got here is, um, why do you believe that we are at the end of uh, an era for, for freight costs? Um, that's, I like that question because um, it's, it's hard to say exactly what you mean. I didn't mean we're at the end of an era. I think what I was trying to say is that the circumstances, 
you know, the, the, freight, the freight cycles are great drivers of trade, but we've come to the end of a period which was quite stable in terms of the underlying technology. I mean, to, to be honest, I, I, you know, when I was in shipbuilding 30 years ago, there isn't that much difference between the Panamax bulk carrier you were building then and the one that you're building now, except size. Whereas there's a lot of things in the business model which will affect the freight rates. Um, and which, so I'm, I think really what I'm saying is that uh, because we're moving into an era of change, there are more variables in the freight model. And I tried to show you that with, you know, that supply demand chart where I was showing you one, two, three, four. I'm trying to show that there are more variables now that, that businesses need to think about. So it's not the end of an era, it's an evolution. Um, the, um, uh, the next one I've got here, the, 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 the possibilities for fuel cell technology and shipping. Um, I, um, the, the, this is from Gerard Nahiri, and thanks. Uh, obviously, a good question. I, I hope I'll deal with that in a more structured way in the next webinar because that'll be devoted to fuels and propulsion. And part of the reason for doing more lectures is that it gives me a bit more time to let, you know, I get all this historical stuff out of the way and I can focus a bit more on the technology. But briefly speaking, um, I uh, um, I, I think the big issue here is um, the is the, the 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 internal combustion engine versus the all electric ship, and the fuel cell is a very nice part of the all electric ship, but that's um, and you know there is a good argument that says that in a lot of trades you might find that once you've got all electric ships with the supporting technology. People will say, "Why did we ever bother with the, you know, with, with the pre predecessors?" I don't I think that's too extreme a statement. Um, the problem at the moment, as I can see it, is that the fuel cell technology, which has, you know, it's been around for a while. I mean, um, you know, I think uh, DNV was running a little fuel cell ship when uh, 2010, you know, 13 years ago. Um, but it does, it does, from what I read, it does seem like there are slightly more viable versions coming along. Um, but the problem is that you still have to find a fuel to put into it, and it needs to be a very good quality fuel. And so the fuel cell falls into the same trap as all other uh, green energy situations that you need, or green energy solutions that you do need to secure a, a source of green bunkers um, and that's that's a challenge in itself which I will go into in the next um, the next lecture in, in a bit more detail um what else have we got here the um what what are the region uh, uh, regional changes taking place now that would impact on shipping that, that's a little bit like um uh, Nicholas's question. I mean, it is, it's, it's the, you know, for shipping companies, it's the biggest of all questions because the regional uh, trade is really tends to be driven by the importers, uh, you know, that they, they call the shots in a way. And um, we, we are seeing um, the, the, these sort of changes taking place. And I think really, um, the, the, the one very big one that you, we all have to focus on is, I mean, China has absolutely dominated shipping in the last 15 years. And I mean, you know, from the, the, the from 2000, when China started to appear, you know, none of us, I don't think anybody could have conceived of how rapidly China's trade would grow. Um, and I think, funnily enough, that you know that was built on the steel industry. And I, I used to follow the, the Chinese um, government forecasts at that time. And I don't think they quite understood quite how fast it was going to to, to grow. But um, it does seem as though we're reaching a level where these heavy industries are shaking down, and China is very interested in is working hard on the green revolution. And um, we have a whole a, a whole changing um, system there. And so I think that the, the, what I call the trade development cycle 
is something that does depend very heavily uh, is something that is is very China is going through that as every other region does. It's you know it's just the way things happen, um, and um, uh, and that will be an important one. Perhaps even more important is the other Asia area, which um, has been a consistent a consistent growth area and has a, a wide range of economies which are moving into a potential uh, area where they could grow very nicely indeed. Um, uh, for example, the changes in the banking system were uh, uh, going to change consumerism in you know, places like India, where you're starting to get um, uh, financial payment systems that really are going to open up business in a way that was not possible before. And that will apply to other economies around Asia and perhaps in um, uh, South America as well. But these are you know, countries with it. So I, I think that um, uh, the, 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 the big question here is whether we can get that that growth spell from Asia will carry on or whether it's going to peak out. I, my inclination is it's, it's going to carry on for a bit longer, but you have to choose your countries. I think that's as much as I want to say at the moment on that. Um, now, what have we got here? Um, uh, this is from um, Julius uh, Mobilik. Hi, will the slide into a presentation? Oh, well, that's a, will the slide presentation be available to participants? At last, a question that I can answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I wish all. I wish you'd all ask me questions as easy as that one. Um, so here's another one. Um, it's for, um, doesn't say who it's from. Where would where would you put your own money? if you had to. Um, well, I mean, I'm not a very adventurous investor. I, I've always liked to invest in things where I knew what was, well, I knew a little bit extra about what was going on. Um, but uh, I, um, and my stock answer to this is, I always used to say, well, I go for an Aframax tanker because that always seemed to me a good solid middle of the road investment run by, decent shipping companies and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, um, I don't, so I don't think I would um, necessarily do that right now. I think I would be looking, number one, I would be looking seriously for startups because I think that to break the mold, I mean, Silicon Valley has been all about this. You're looking for companies that will break the mold. That's, you know, if you look, go back to containerization, I was talking about hardly any of the liner companies um, in the um, early 60s, they all knew about containerization. Hardly any of them really successfully managed their way through it because they're stuck in the old world. And it's not they can't, don't, want to change it's just very hard to change um, and to change quickly uh, so I think we might have some you know there might be some companies that will come up here and will break the model break the mold uh, and you know we all know how that's happening in land-based businesses um, so that's the first thing the second thing is I would look at substantial shipping I, I wouldn't look at the ships I'd look at the substantial shipping companies that have the capacity to manage the IT side and might actually have enough strategic capability and drive to really plow through and produce a new business. You know, going back to the, um, the Peter Druckers quote at the beginning, companies that are actually able to grasp the nettle, motivate their staff, and drive forward, raise the funds and drive forward to a new business, which will actually start to run value added shipping using the new technology that is realistically available. And it is there, but it's not easy. And so I think that, that's the second place I'd put number one startups. As I actually said that to you, I found myself keener on looking for the companies that have got the depth and the capability to grow and to adapt to change really and maybe mid-sized companies so that that's 
for that, that's my answer now. You could ask me the same question at the end of this series because I, you know, I keep thinking about this. I mean, it's for me, this is a, a, a voyage of discovery as well. Um, I, uh, what this is from um, Ashutosh Kumar. Um, uh, do forgive me if I don't quite get the, the, the pronunciation right. What do you see the best fuel funding strategy? for ship owners to be achieved from cargo companies, as there is a big reluctance on fuel transition cost sharing. Yeah, you know, I mean, you've summed it up better than I did. That's the problem. I mean, you've summed up the problem. Um, the, the, the problem is that, I, I mean, I, you know, I, one of the benefits of being around is that you, you, for a long time, is that you see how these happen in practice. and. If you, I've lived through this because when I first started in the business, um, the oil companies ran their tanker business. They they controlled 80, 80 to 90% of the tanker fleet. Uh, they owned 40%. They gave out time charters, long time charters to for another 40%, which allowed a whole generation of ship owners to get rich by buying, they took they hocked the time took the, the time charter to bankers, um, and because it was by, from a triple A um, uh, charterer, they could raise the money, and so that worked extremely well in a business which was very risk averse, if you like. I mean, the existing shipping companies were reluctant to borrow even against a charter, and so a whole new generation of ship owners came in and exploited that market. Uh, but then what happened? So if but you needed the, the the cargo companies to be willing and to do the deal on the long time charter. And what we saw was they were willing to do that in the 50s and 60s because they really wanted very big ships and the owners were not prepared to order very big ships without a time charter. So, you know, they did it because they had to. Then once you got into the meltdown and over ordering of the 70s, the big ships were there. The spot market meant that they could hire the ships as cheap, cheap as chips. They're dead cheap. And so, well, it wasn't just they didn't want to do time charters anymore or own their own fleets anymore. It was that the, the rates from the spot market were so, so low that um, they couldn't get the, 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 the whole uh, program for investment program through their board. The, their boards wanted 15% return and the best they could come up with shipping was 8%. So you never got more time charters after that, not much. Um, so I think there's a new era um, and at some stage, it's a matter of um, doing something that very few people in the industry do, to my, in my experience. And we, we, because of the marketplace, people think of um, the, the cargo owners not, uh, not really as their customers, but as the opposition, because the whole thing is a negotiated market. You know, it's like play, you're playing poker against them, and that's not a normal customer relationship. And somehow, some companies are going to build new relationships, and that's how you're going to do that, I think. And so, I'd say the answer. To, I'm sorry, it's a very long answer, but um, I think that it's going to be up to the companies to build to to actually lay out. Um, a proposition which is attractive enough to the cargo owners, to, which adds enough value, not attractive, which adds enough value for the cargo owners to really do it. And they will want to crawl all over it, I would have thought. Um, okay, uh, so um, uh, oh, it's from Jonathan Atkin, yes. Um, now, this is quite a long question. Um, let me read this. Um, as every At every shipping conference from Nicholas's capital link to marine money, every conference for 20 years has complained how the general and investing sectors do not value or perceive outside of the shipping community itself, the globalization role of shipping, um, the glue of the planet. Yeah, good comment. What role could media commissioned, media commissioned by ship owners, cargo owners, and investors play in creating a better recognition by the world 
in our industry? More importantly, is it the responsibility of the above? Few cargo shipping efforts are comprehensive in this effort. Should they review their policies in communicating to the world and break the model of media or should that and break the model of media being an afterthought. Well, you know, I I went through a spell 20 over Jonathan, great question. I, I went through a spell of um, doing, always doing tanker que uh, questions, you know, uh, presentations about this at the time when the tanker industry were just desperate to get time charters again. I used to follow Eric Shaw around and Eric would say, you know, the tanker owners, the tanker companies ought to do time charters. And then I would say the market was terrible and um, we then have a debate. Um, and I remember at one of these, um, there, is a, there is a sort of media element in it because at one of these, um, uh, tanker conferences in London, uh, it must have been that well, well over 20 years ago, they had a very well-known BBC personality, I think it's called Magnus Magnusson, and he described um, ship owners as pirates in blazers, right? <laughs> and that sort of, that, 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 that is not the way you want your customers to see you. And so I think there is some sense of needing to do it, but I don't really find the media, running a media campaign very attractive. I think that people are not stupid and our customers are not stupid. What they want is companies of integrity with the depth to actually deliver something when they go on to meet them, you know, more than giving them a good dinner, but they, um, they can actually start, put something on the table that seems to add value. And that is, you can do that. I mean, I remember, you know, I mean, Lars Carlson uh, at Concordia was a, a great marketeer because he would go around and he managed to get charters out of, um, uh, uh, for, for very old ships, but, you know, out of very respectful companies. And he did it by, uh, you know, giving, putting forward a platform that seemed to work. So I, I, I think my answer to that is that, Rather, I, I mean, it's hard to convince anybody. I mean, nobody does know about shipping. Um, it's a great story, shipping's great fun, but that's not what this is about. What this is about is surfing the wave by figuring out something that will add enough value to be able to take that to the cargo owners and use it to persuade them to help you to give you something that will help you to fund the plan that will deliver that product and um, part of that is going to be probably an organization that has a lot more to it than the sort of organizations that you could afford to run in um, you know under the, with the very small companies in the market so you know I think you need a certain critical mass to start to build up that depth, which will enable you to deliver, a, convince a cargo owner that you actually are going to deliver and that you're a worthy partner for a big corporation, which most of these cargo owners are. I mean, that that's a sort of top of the head, but I'll come back to this one. A great question and thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for raising it. Um, uh, here's another one from Jonathan that says, correction, stop for oops. <laughs> I know how you feel. <laughs> um, Andrew Coggins, as the balance ships from, shifts from the Atlantic to the Pacific, are the ports ready to handle the shift? Hallelujah, we've mentioned the ports. Um, you know, it is a funny thing. I One thing I do get a chance you know, I, I, to do, I've had my spell in shipbuilding, in banking and shipbroking, um, but I do get a chance to get around the world and talk to a lot of people. And it is, it's funny how people don't regard the shipping companies. I mean, the ports, like just as the ship owners don't really re always regard the cargo owners as, as customers in quite the way that most businesses do, the ports don't really regard the ship owners as customers either in many ways, I, I find. Um, it, it, and it's understandable because 
you know, one of the, the, it, 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 the way the dynamic is set up it is not very favorable to that. But some uh, ports are doing some great work in um, moving things forwards. I mean, Rotterdam in doing the sort of transshipment from deep sea to short sea and that sort of thing. And um, we have a mass of small ports and medium sized ports which many of which have very, um, you know, directors who are very keen to do things, but really need a network to plug into so they could they know what to deliver. And there's some very interesting new, I mean, on the container side, you know, these sort of autonomous cranes and things um, are beginning. I mean, that's one area where I think um, autonomy can really be very helpful. M McGregor's have um have prototype well working prototypes of autonomous cranes and if you're trying to move stuff into smaller ports to get it much closer to the final destination then that's the sort of thing that might happen so i um i i think there's a big job for the ports to do and again may i visit that in a little bit more later i mean i i think it's a, it's a great question um oh jonathan i've got an addendum from you um Where media um, communicating on a larger scale, the change innovation breaking mold, where media can create drive, motivation, and added value. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, 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 I completely take your point. There should be somewhere in this for media. Um, uh, I don't know. It's um, uh, could I, could I come back to that next next time? Because I don't. Um, I'd like to think it through. I mean, you you're, you're pushing me down a line, and that's why, you know, I'm really enjoying this. Is that I'm you know you're pushing me to sort of articulate more about the things that I've said in general. So, can, can, Jonathan, can I come back to that one if I may? Um, Oh, oh, Peter Evanson. Hi there, Peter. Um, um, teaser for the future episode. Do you think productivity gains can make up for the extra cost of new technologies? Um, you know, uh, this is this is great. I've, I've got a book here on my desk I, um, by a very good um, uh, um, economist um, from the 1950s who wrote about the first industrial revolution in the 17th century. And when I opened it, this was just last week, I sort of, I'm always looking around for how other people have looked at these things. And one of the things she said was that the first um, industrial revolution, it was done by um, uh, entrepreneurs. This is like the 18th century. But the, the problem was that you had masses of infrastructure, like you were doing canals, you're doing railways, um, you're doing ports, vast quantities of money going in. And these were going into a business that was not generating any much money at all. The, the sums of money were much bigger. And so I think Peter, the, the sort of conclusion, but what she said was that that money came available. They had these crazy investments, um, like the railways got masses of money out of the... Um, uh, out of private investors, just they had a feeding feeding frenzy, and um, the same sort of thing happened with the canals and uh, and the ports. You know, people were keen to put up money, and the you know the old widows, a lot of them, the old widows and parsons, they poured their money into these investment booms, and they lost quite a lot of it. You know, so and what she said in the end was actually, although you would have thought this stuff ought to have come from the government it didn't it came from private investors and i think you know silicon valley has a message here you know you can package stuff up if you can get the message right you can package stuff up and you know it if you can get to be um, a unicorn um which i know is difficult but i've seen people can do it uh with a lot less than you could do with a really good um digital meat screen shipping model you know where you're going to change the world i i think uh, um i think it can be done so but that's my top of the head answer 
Peter. I think I I, well, I end up with the Silicon Valley type of thing. You you just need a a pile of cash, and there's one th there is a lot of cash around. You know, it's just they they don't want to give it. They really don't want to give it to pirates and blazers. You know, so you've got to get a better marketing pitch. Um, uh, Shashi um, Bhushan. Um, are ship managers ready to employ green fuels without affecting operational safety? Um, I, um, well, you know, I, one of the things I've been doing recently, I wrote a, a, a long paper about, for a learned journal, about governance. I mean, I sort of got talked into it, but... Um, uh, by Jan Hoffman from UNCTAD, I, but I did enjoy it in the end. And um, this got me thinking about um, governance and who is responsible. And one of the conclusions that I came to in this paper was that we all look at IMO and the flag states and criticize them for being, you know, they're so slow and they don't really understand the business, etc. But I reckon there are four layers of governance. I mean, there's IMO at the top, there's the flag states and uh, sort of below them. But then you've got the shipping company boards who are absolutely right at the, they're, they're spiders at the beginning. They're the guys who are going to make it work. And below them, you've got the ships and the ship's officers, and they are just as important. And you need all of them. They all have a responsibility to make these things work. And um, the, the point I'm really coming round to here is that um, the, the, the ship management companies are in a funny position because they're neither mouse nor man. They don't quite control the resources in the same way that, um, that, that, that and they are very much under cost pressures which makes it very difficult. So I think that my quick answer to that is that ship management, um, it, they're, they're going to have to follow the lead of the companies that they're uh, working for, I would say. I think it's very hard for the ship managers. This is just top of the head to, to um, you know, to, 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 to actually initiate things. Just the framework is just not very good. Um, uh, oh yes, um, Anthony Papad uh, Papadopoulos. Um, I've got um, a question. Well, I've got a question there. Oh, sorry, Anthony. It's um, um, Flavia Vasconcelos. Vas I do apologise. I'm um, I'm having to lean over my screen to read these, um, and I never was very good at pronouncing difficult names. Well, I mean. You'd think so with a name like Stopford, which is incredibly difficult. <laughs> um, what role would governments have in the scenery you showed us? I mean, is there any kind of public policy that will make these changes and innovations faster? Well, you know, I've just actually spent um, a couple of days. Um, I went to the opera to see... Um, Get to Dameron last night with Tim Harris from um, who used to uh, um, um, was at Fishers and uh, was the chairman of Clarkson some years ago, um, and of course OCL. And we um, we talk quite a bit about the the the, the fact that the the it, certainly in the UK, UK today. Um, people expect the governments to do everything. And on the whole, they're not really very good at doing it. And having worked in a nationalised industry, I, uh, I would never want to work in a nationalised industry again. And it is, they're too slow. And I, I do think the fact we nationalise our shipbuilders, um, and I was working there and was to some extent responsible for the fact none of them survived. I think some of, if we hadn't been nationalised, some of them would have survived. There was one or two very good companies in there, but well, they got smothered, you know. So I think that really, um, I don't think public policy is going to do this. What shipping is good at is uh, is shipping, and in the end, somebody will get their act together doing the sorts of things we're talking about this afternoon, and they will make it work. The company governance and the ship management governance will make it work. You will. IMO and flag states, because they're what the governments are, are in a very, very weak position. They don't have resources. 
they're way up there. They don't really understand the problems. And I think that it's the, the you know, the buck stops with the governance layer. On the governance thing, it stops with the shipping companies and with the people in the hot seat, you know, in, in, on the ships themselves, um, with both of which. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, um, uh, Anthony, yes, thank you for your question. Um, I, um, uh, 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 what is the role that banks can play in the transition phase of the shipping industry? Um, well, in a way, you know, the banks are pig in the middle. Um, I mean, having, I, I suppose having, having worked for ship, part of the first part of my life in shipbuilding and the second part of my life, um, not for very long, but one of the nicest parts of my life um, in a bank, an American bank, and then in a shipbroking company, um, it's one of the things that was very noticeable was when you went to um, talk to, when, when you were a shipbuilder and you went to talk to a ship owner, they, they wouldn't really tell you much. They, you know, they wanted to know what you could do for them. They wouldn't tell you very much about what they were up to and what their business was. And it was very hard to develop any sort of, I mean, product development in shipbuilding is a bit of a nightmare. Um, and in shipbroking, of course, they you can have a very good dialogue, but in most cases, you know, the the, the, the customers will only uh, the the, uh, the the charters will only tell you the things they want everybody else to know. You know, it's a, a limited. And the great thing about the banks is that you can have a confidential. The banks are in a position to have a confidential position um, with shipping a uh, conversation confidential conversation with shipping companies and you know they have the a breadth which a lot of shipping companies don't in their own resources and one of the jobs of banks um is not just to provide um debt which is the uh, was but is to actually you know get uh, their customers into decent shape so that they can actually structure themselves in a way which will enable them to raise money. I mean, that's what merchant investment banks do and, and big banks do that. And so and I, th I think my answer to that question is that what banks can contribute is the sort of um, business support which um, any company in shipping is going to need a lot of because you can't do it all yourself. And it's very hard to have this sort of um, heart searching discussions with most people because confidentiality is, is an issue and it gets in the way. And banks, the one thing that banks do have is, in, we hope, is integrity and confidentiality. And so I think that I would say that is what they they bring a lot of other things to the table. They bring expertise, and they, if you go, to, if you were to go down, you know, the Silicon Valley route, you're not going to do it without a bank, you know. Um, uh, a nom uh, um, so thank you, thank you very much, uh, Anthony, for that that nice question. Um, I hope that's a little bit of an answer. Um, and I think we're at the end now. So um, just one more question. Can you talk about the use of uh, Lidbar and um, to, to avoid collisions, reduce staffing needs, Lid Lidar and uh, lead towards shipping, unmanned shipping? Um, I don't know the answer to that um, that question. I'll, I'll have to look into it. And I see we're we're well over our um, uh, our time anyway. So perhaps this is a good time to wind, wind it up, Nicholas. Would you say? But I think compared to the three hour marathon that we had last time, uh, now we are at an hour and fifteen minutes. So <laughs> this is just the warm up. Anyway, I wanted to thank you. You know, as expected. Um, it has been a great uh, first uh, webinar in, in the series. Great insight. Thank you very, very much. I'm uh, absolutely grateful and humbled that um, you agreed to do this with us. Uh, it means a lot to us. And uh, thank you very much.
Uh, and, th and thank you, Nicholas, and thanks you for everybody who it's it was you know been really great to have the audience, but also to have the questions. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you all the next uh, one that we have two weeks from now and uh, uh, June fifteen. And uh, also, please, if you would like to download the slides, you can go to capitalinkwebinars.com. Give us a little bit of time to post everything there, but they will be available for you to download. Thank you. Great. Oh, thank you.